Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to the Julius Podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Shafen Painburn, who works in the tech industry within California around the land of Elon Musk. Please welcome Shafen Painburn. What's up, guys? Yeah, in the land of Elon Musk, for, for sure. Okay, only Tesla's here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that matters is Tesla and a corporate tech takeover. That's about oh it. Oh my God, that's such a hot take. So many people won't like hearing that, but uh, yeah. What's up, guys? Uh, known Julius for years now, good friends, and really excited to talk about whatever we want to talk about today. Answer any questions. For sure, man. I'm glad to hear it. So what is your occupation within the tech industry, and how do you like it so far? Yeah, so I'm pretty basic. Uh, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I My most recent position was a software engineer for Google, working in Google Ads. Extremely exciting stuff. I know everybody's just at the edge of their seat to hear that. But uh, yeah, uh, but I was part of the layoffs, unfortunately, for Google and my position was also impacted, was, which is like its own story because I hear that wasn't like based on performance entirely really either. Like some people were not expecting that at all. It was super random. People called their managers. Their managers didn't even know. They started crying together. Uh, it was crazy. So, uh, and I got a bunch of messages also like, uh, we didn't know this was going to happen. This was super unexpected. Um but, you know, things happen and now I'm just uh, on the job search, but I've been a software engineer for a few years now. I've also worked in an enterprise company, Albertsons, uh, which is also somewhat of a meme. If you go on blinds, the community for uh, tech workers, mostly at this point, uh, who are just <laughs> talking about shit. And they just talk about Albertsons as if it was a joke. Um, but yeah, that's uh, kind of my background, what I am and what I'm doing. Fantastic. Uh, please explain uh, to the audience, because not, not a lot of people know about the uh, layovers within the tech industry in California. Oh, the layoffs. Yeah. 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 Uh, layoffs have definitely gone up a lot, especially in tech. Uh, some people might have seen like from news and just general, maybe friends that they know. Um, but it started with, I mean, it started actually around 2020 uh, as well. But like, uh, for the most part, tech was doing super well, like in terms of stocks, uh, they were just like shooting up. I mean, everybody knows Tesla kind of like quadrupled or whatever amount. It was like a thousand percent up and whoever invested in them was like a genius all of a sudden. Uh, but it, it hit especially hard uh, late last year. And a lot of the large tech companies did a bunch of layoffs. And at this point now, like startups are following suit. They've been struggling since 2020 because investors have not been like, as interested or they're holding on to their cash. They don't want to do speculative investing. Angel investing is what those are called. Um, so because of that, it's kind of like the tech field in general has been a lot more um, scarce in real opportunities, especially with how dense it is uh, in the job market. Um, so, you know, it's tough to get a job at like Facebook, Google, Amazon. Uh, Apple's actually doing okay, but that's because they didn't do uh, layoffs so much they're kind of holding on to their employees but they're being more strict and that's something that's like really prominent right now in tech right now is uh they're just having the positions open but there's being extremely strict on what like the requirements are now whereas previously maybe it was a little bit more flexible uh in requirements like some of them would say like five years of experience and if you had like three it's okay uh but nowadays uh five years of experience kind of means five years of experience and stuff like that well, you know what they say, you, you need to have like five years of experience to get a job when you have no experience, when you just get oh, out of man. school. Yeah. I hate that shit. It's like, you need to get a job. You need experience to get experience. You need a job. Yeah. The <laughs> Classic chicken and the egg one. dilemma. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So question about the saturation of the tech industry. Do yeah. you think that's part of the problem of why investors and businesses that wants to get into the tech field, do you think that was included in the problem of maybe cutting back with the layoffs? Or was it because of something else entirely? Or what was going uh, on with this uh, layoffs within? You said it did start in 2020. It recently came to light around this year in 2023, maybe late 2022, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a good question. I didn't clarify that entirely. In 2020, it was like actually a hiring boom. Mm -hmm. uh, the startups were still doing layoffs because investors during pandemic were mostly like, you know, wanting to save their money. 
but large tech companies were still hiring a lot. They're growing a lot, a uh, midsize even too. Um, but that was still considered the start for me too, even for those larger companies, because the biggest reason people were doing, our companies were doing layoffs in late 22 uh, and you know up to now in 23 um, is because they were overstaffed. They overhired and they no longer saw the value uh, of the amount of employees they had that they hired up to this point um, for the amount of growth that they were expecting because of just such a high exponential growth in every large company and every tech company that was on the stock market since 2020. Um, and that's kind of what led to a lot of the layoffs and uh, even companies that maybe couldn't afford their employees as well, but didn't want to start as the first in company to lay off. Mm -hmm. uh, after other companies start laying off, it's kind of prompting them to be like, oh yeah, you know, tough times, just like all these other companies, we're going to also lay off a thousand people. And so it's just become a cycle of like, you know, because the wave has started, it's just continuing until it starts dying down eventually. There, it's mostly to cut costs, uh, headcount costs. So right now, from what I'm hearing, we're in that cycle where they're cutting down, as you said, because the oversaturation of the tech market of employees was just too much i'm assuming yeah and they're yeah. hiring all of them um but they thought that the company like they were going to keep growing as much as it was in 2020 mm -hmm. but that was just uh because of you know everybody being at home they were using software a lot more naturally because of that like zoom actually zoom had a big layoff uh relatively recently and they were hiring like crazy up until like early this year um, because they thought they were just going to keep going to the moon or something. But mm -hmm. it turns out it was just because everybody was working from home because of the pandemic. And that's why Zoom grew so much. It was oversaturated in its like client base. Um, but then they ended up oversaturating their headcount because of that. And then they went to layoffs. It's like a pretty good example from that one. But every other tech company had a similar experience where just because online use and software use was more prominent since the pandemic, um, before we started moving back in person, uh, they just got like a, a boost in their stocks that they thought was actually growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to determine whether your stock is you're going to go up or down or what actions or decisions increase the value within your company. Say, for example, Elon Musk, you know, everyone loves to talk about Tesla. Some people say and do notice the patterns that when Elon Musk says something on Twitter, it is determined to whether your stock goes up or down for Tesla. And it's all like, oh, did he say something stupid this time? Oh, did yeah. he smoke weed on Joe Rogan? Oh, did he do something that the other shareholders don't like? Which is kind of confounded if you think about it. Like one simple action with a uh, social media presence, everyone's has watching. has nothing to do with the product too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has nothing to do with the product. It has something to do with who's the owner, what is he doing right now, and do people like it? And it's a little... It's a little absurd if you think about it. It just shows that, you know, stock prices and company values and what you're investing in, if you're an individual company kind of inve investor, individual stock investor, mm -hmm. is the, the price is going up based on the viewpoint of the public and the investors who are investing in that company. It's not like always really based on the achievements of the company on mm -hmm. what it raises the stock price. It's just who's investing, who's adding more money in, and it's very psychological, right? So Elon Musk says something stupid and a bunch of investors think, oh my God, he's ruining everything. Then they sell stocks and it has nothing to do with the product. Or they think that Tesla is going to continue going to the moon and they have these products that are going to be great. So because of the expectation, it prematurely boosts the stock as well. Um, but it has nothing to do with the actual achievements. It's always just psychology and their perception and you want to hope that it's because investors are more engaged and they're like, you know, they know and believe in, in the company and that's why they're investing over time. Um, but these days with such easy ways to invest like Robinhood and Re Weeble or whatever other like brokerage platform. Yeah, uh, other investing apps, yeah, per se. Yeah, it's like, sorry if I'm plugging, you know, non-sponsors or something like that, but- Yeah, we're not sponsored but, by the way. <laughs> we're not, yeah, not sponsored by we're Weeble or Robinhood. We're not sponsored whatsoever. Yeah. And we don't support Robinhood or something like that. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah. By, by the way, explain what recently happened with Robinhood and why people are sh staving away from using it now. Well, I mean, 
I don't know if something else has happened most yeah. recently. No, because I heard a story about it. Like people are staying away from Robin Hood because they did something. I forgot what it was though. But basically, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I don't know a lot of details, but I do know that Robin Hood has a certain way of making money. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know how it's free to use their platform and you make trades. Yeah. Um, I I can't remember the other company yeah. name. They're well, probably also- with another company. Also, you have to pay a commission to them when you use it. You have to pay like a certain fee, not commission. I apologize. It's more of a fee because since it's free and you have to buy a stock through their platform, they have to make money somehow. And by that, they get like a, I'm assuming it's a commission fee or just a fee for just buying a stock and selling. So whatever. Yeah, act, I think it has yeah. something to do with that. And yeah, so- whenever like because of that influence of them being kind of commissioned, mm-hmm. uh, they they had like these huge problems where when a stock was boosting up really fast, uh, especially like meme stocks, uh, they had to freeze it because I think the company that they were part- partnered with said like they they would not let them trade anymore yeah, or something like that. And so because they froze it, it kind of like, um, you know, paused the momentum, which can be good, but most people don't like that. They didn't want that to happen. So I think it like made people dislike Robinhood more because of that. They've also like, tried starting some like features that were (laughs) suspicious like i think they had like a uh cash account or something or a savings account that you could start and they're like yield if you know yields for savings Mm -hmm. account Mm -hmm. um they're like offering a crazy high yield i forgot what it was was it like eight or ten percent where like normally at that time it was like at most three Mm -hmm. or maybe it was even lower so it just got really suspicious and they just took it down without saying anything. Mm-hmm. And people were just like, I don't know about Robin Hood and their practices and stuff like that. And I'm sure there's a lot more. Honestly, I'm kind of surface level on that, but I don't use Robin Hood. Um, so yeah, I don't really know too much. I just yeah. know that a lot of people d- uh, dislike them now. Well, I bet because if they lost their money in that high yield savings account and they can't get their money, if that did really happen, I, I hope it didn't. But if it did, I'm pretty sure that would piss everyone off. It's like, Where's my money? And so like within the past year or two, it's like, because eight to 10% is a pretty good uh, margin return compared to like the average one to 3% yield. I'm like, okay. Yeah, honestly. And I, I don't think anybody actually was able to sign up. They're mostly garnering interest by like having you like sign up to potentially get it. Uh, okay. And because of them not being like FDIC insured or whatever insurance, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that usually bank accounts, they have that where it's like, up to 200 or up to even $500,000 they yeah, of insurance, would be yeah. insured. And like, if the bank failed, then the government would pay them back or something, or FDIC would. Um, Robin Hood didn't have any of that. And I think like all the, those things kind of servicing also make them take it down before they actually opened up accounts. Um, but another thing that you just reminded me of, uh, I don't know how, is I do remember there was a kid who ended up committing suicide because they falsely showed an extremely large negative balance and the kid freaked out so much and got so depressed that they actually ended up committing suicide which is super unfortunate and it's not like you know it's it, I don't know how like what was going through their mind and I don't know if they were like double checking anything but in the end of the day Robin Hood really did mess up there um, because they should know that money is very psychological and that it influences people a lot. So if you show somebody after they make a certain investment that now they are negative and owe like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, they're going to spiral down because they were hoping to make money, not like lose all their money and be in debt for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. 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 It's unfortunate. I did hear about that story. Fortunately, I have to play devil's advocate on this. He did join that platform and usually these platforms always say we bear no responsibility for whatever action you do because it's like gambling i guess at the end of the day it's your responsibility to use these platforms and to invest and see what you can do i'm sorry to say though but it's it's unfortunate to hear he lost so much money and if i recall it was actually either a year after the pandemic or during the pandemic somewhere around that time yeah but it, was and a this glitch. Was... it wasn't even that he actually lost that much money mm-hmm yeah. yeah. So it was actually a software error. That's that's where I think the problem is. Yeah. 
it would if they actually lost that much money on their own that would make sense mm -hmm. and their reaction to that is definitely not their responsibility but if it was because of an error on their end mm -hmm. then that's definitely their fault and they induced a certain reaction based on their mistake mm -hmm. yeah and then there's always going to be terms of use covering their asses for whatever you know but at the end of the day i don't know i don't know if you get to sleep good at night because you just made a contract yeah. and a disclaimer and then somebody yeah. commits suicide because of a mistake you made but mm -hmm. because you're legally safe are you do you really feel good about that i don't know that's, that's mm -hmm. just how i feel i would feel very responsible for something yeah. like that it's a very uh morally gray area yeah. for, for some people like for people that are like highly empathetic like you and i it's all like yeah this sounds messed up and someone should should be responsible for this and rectify the mistakes well you can't really fix anything about it because unfortunately he's dead already but to yeah. prevent you know stuff like that in the future any yeah. software user error they should definitely you know take that into account yeah i agree with you well there is of course a bunch of software errors within the tech space whether it be from crypto or unfortunately from uh trading platforms like weeble because i i don't i don't really trade stocks like that not anymore. Oh, I, I do use uh, I use Ally. I oh, use Ally Invest. Yeah, I use Ally Invest for two in, uh, informal investing accounts, and I think Ally is pretty good for trading in general. And I think that their accounts for high yield savings is actually potentially good. I'm not sponsored by Ally, by the way, guys. I I just think <laughs> that it's just really potentially good, you know. Same here. Actually, I have Ally, and I have a high yield savings account. I even did one of their CDs. Um, mm -hmm. And I also have an Ally Invest account for personal investing, um, uh -huh. but for like retirement, I I do Vanguard. But yeah, I think they're pretty good too. Not all, also not sponsored. I mean, I'm the guest. How am I sponsored? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to not use the major banks here in America, uh, try Ally. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Wells Fargo. Yeah. No. Even though unfortunately I use it too, but. <laughs> ah, Julius. Yeah. Okay. Come on, man. <laughs> well, whatever, you know, it is. Well, yeah. All right. If you were to start anew or if you had, you know, your kids already and they were getting into finance, what major bank would you start them with first? Um, Let's see. Well, major bank, I guess mm -hmm. maybe I'd go with Chase. You think um, Chase is a safer bet? Better than Wells Fargo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ironically talked with a photographer because I was at an event and he said that Chase is actually one of the worst. Well, when, when are they all not the worst? But his all the case, big ones are the worst. Yeah, yeah, no matter what. But this yeah. one was way worse than the rest of them because he said that when you have a certain amount of money in there, I think it's more than $25,000 and you're trying to withdraw it, you have to sign a bunch of paperwork just to get your $25,000 in cash because Chase doesn't initially have the actual cash where you can get the cash. I'm Actually, like, that's every bank. Yeah. Well, uh, that's super yeah. common practice. You put your money in and they actually cycle your money yeah. uh, to make money off of that. Um, they don't actually hold it usually, but 25000 is kind of low, honestly. Um, I'm kind of surprised to hear that. Uh, Wells Fargo probably could do 25000 It's just they're going to be like watching and maybe you would have to sign off. You probably would have to do it in person. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, most banks, they don't want to take out like they can't take out like globs of cash at once. Um, that's why there was like a potential banking crisis where some banks were failing because everybody was trying to take their money out at the same time. That's also what caused the Great Depression um, in the early 1900s because everybody tried to take their money out at the same time and they don't have the money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a real thing, but I think Wells Fargo is still at my complete bottom <laughs> because they've just had the most scandals. I mean, it's not like other banks don't, yeah. it's just Wells Fargo keeps doing it and getting caught. <laughs> They're so bad that they keep getting caught. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do with the major banks? Oh, you have heard about the two major, two banks that crashed in the Silicon Valley. Yeah, I didn't like follow that too much because <laughs> mm -hmm. they're two smaller banks. Yeah. But uh, they started getting like, I think, sponsored or paid by like larger banks to prevent like too much scare. Right. That's what I heard. Well, well, they got cashed out by the government so they could 
stay alive. Oh, the government. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, see. I remember like also major banks were like uh, donating and, and like putting money in to try to prevent that because they didn't want the same thing to happen to them. Yeah. Uh, and it seemed, I guess it kind of worked. I mean, I'm not hearing more about it. Yeah. yeah no, I did. Everybody was talking about the one from San Jose. I don't remember yeah. the name. Yeah. Those two. I forgot what they're called, but basically yeah. they got bailed up by the government in the end. Because, you know, everyone everyone was going to lose their money. Their clients, people that were working there. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. a good look. So you got daddy government. Always. You know. <laughs> yeah, you don't want you don't want more crashes and, uh, you know, stuff going down. You got government yeah. to save your ass. Yeah. And that's why they did the same in 2020 as well. A oh, lot man. of bailouts usually yeah. targeted towards larger businesses, but it looked like it was for anybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in your opinion, well, it's not really opinion. You could just tell by history. Why do most large corporations and big businesses are bailed out by the government? Well, I mean, that's probably, I would guess it's because we're capitalist, right? This society is kind of run on capital, right? It's in the name. And if big businesses start failing, then money's not going to cycle as well through our economy. Mm-hmm. So the government is highly incentivized to keep large businesses going so that we can continue to cycle money through um, our like country. Yeah. And I mean, that's like a super basic way to put it, I guess. Um, yeah. You know, it's just, it comes down to the macroeconomics. And if we, if they focus too much on the, well, I mean, it's always trying to emphasize small businesses and mid-sized businesses trying to help them grow. But in reality, the current enterprises that exist are keeping us running and keeping our country in like a very high like monetary level i mean on top of also you know the billionaires that just hold on to that money but uh even so uh their businesses also cycle a lot of money through and the government wants to keep that going or else the gdp will decrease Mm -hmm. and they don't want that to happen yeah they usually don't want that to happen yeah Yeah, and small businesses are not going to contribute that kind of money um, mm-hmm. so if they are going to fail and a lot more of small businesses fail, like each year, uh, the government is not usually really incentivized to like help them as much as like, say Walmart is going to fail, mm-hmm. then that would really affect our, like on a national scale, uh, GDP mm-hmm. and the cycle of money. And yeah, so I'm sure they're like, I mean, if we want to get like really conspiracy esque with it, like I'm oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead lobbyists also talking to uh legislators and convincing them to work together and help each other out and so they're going to want to look out for these people more because they're also getting something out of it right well other than that since this is also the main infrastructure of america is capitalism and if these main corporations don't run properly as in they're just doing their thing whether they go up or down, but they're still alive and intact, then that keeps our economy intact, which means we have a peaceful, sane society. Not to say whether it's good or bad, but we need things to be running for things to work properly. Yep, things are running, even if it's poorly. (laughs) Yeah. It's being run. So um, I guess some people call that a win. And people who are wealthy and very successful in, on a money standpoint, probably very much like it. And you hear advocates for it and they love this society and the system. And they also happen to be millionaires. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, let's transition back into the tech industry. What, what did you work as? Because if I recall, you were a coder, but you said you were also into Google Analytics marketing. So were oh, you... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I know. Software engineer for Google, and it was mm-hmm. for Google Ads. But that was the team I was in. I was uh, in, like, you know, yeah, working to improve the software for Google Ads. I didn't, like, do another Google Ads thing on the side, like, mm-hmm. as my own thing or, like, a second job. Yeah. yeah. So you weren't doing marketing. You were just working on a marketing software product for Google. Yeah, it was their marketing software product. And I was in audience targeting and reporting infrastructure. Sounds really crazy or fancy but honestly it was just i showed analytics Mm -hmm. and data and suggestions for like companies to target certain audiences so that they can get the best results for their ads uh and like that software so if you ever built a google ads campaign 
Um, and if you went into like something like um, Performance Max or yeah, like one of their other tabs for that, then like most likely I've also worked on some of the things that you might have interacted with. Yeah. We were like pretty focused on Performance Max because it was a new feature and it was like very automated. Um, so that's kind of like mostly what I'm thinking of. Um, but there's others, there's like video ads and regular like search ads as well. Um, mm -hmm. Might have like done some minor things for that. Oh, cool, cool. So what 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 do you think about all these type of software is now being integrated into one AI, which then just turns into one mesh product? Because right now AI is the new hot thing within the tech industry and overall, because yeah. you know, oh, we're taking our jobs oh, this is like helping me cheat on an exam or it can do my paper in a co in college, you know, for like my English class or something. Yeah, there's that one like um, meme on it of just like the student uses ChatGPT or something to do their essay and the teacher uses ChatGPT to grade it or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if everybody's using it, I guess in like some, in certain use cases, it's super useful. Actually, Programmers can benefit a lot from ChatGPT because it can give you a lot of boilerplate code. It can give you suggestions. It can answer like certain, like, I don't know, minor bug issues or certain things you might want to do. If you want to convert one language to another language, it might do it very well. Um, but I personally don't feel like AI is like replacing our jobs in the next year and people are trying to turn it into this like super soon AI is going to develop to a point where it's like building full websites and games by itself. Like everybody's trying to post articles and videos on that, but then you watch it and then you realize it's like, it's actually super buggy and chat GPT, like say we actually could use an AI to build like a full website, every page and like, you know, whatever you wanted from it, but then there's a bug and your web page crashes. And then you're like, oh, chat, chat GPT, it crashed, fix it. It's not, it's not gonna fix it. I mean, it's I, at least in its current stage, I highly doubt it would be able to find the bug, fix the bug and put your like app back into deployment all by itself without you having to do anything. It would require like software knowledge that if you had any sort of bug and you have like an HTTP error, you're going to have to research it on your own. But then even if you did try to research it on your own, imagine like, you know, say you wrote in, like you want to write an essay and then you have like ChatGPT do like a scholarly article for you and you hardly have any like experience or knowledge on the topic and it writes a 20 page essay for you. And then you realize something was wrong. And now you got to find which page at what area it was incorrect at which word and how to find it. The problem is, and the point I'm making is if it builds a whole app for you, even if you have some knowledge, you might have a lot more trouble actually finding the error and where the problem is and how to even fix it without breaking it somewhere else. So an essay might not have been a perfect analogy, but at the same time, it's just there's so many problems and nuances that would come with using AI to like for certain use cases, like also AI art is like a big one, but then like you see AI art and if you look closely, it's got like weird, like third arms or like the arm is like through the body and you didn't realize it at first or something like it's definitely got a long way to go. I mean, it's very impressive too, but it's got a long way to go. It's not replacing jobs that like at a large scale anytime soon. Japan, you said you were in the software engineering sector, but now currently you are not because of the layoffs. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, well, I still am considered a software engineer, but just, yeah, I'm not like, because I'm staying in the field. I'm not switching or anything, but yeah, mm -hmm. currently jobless, hobo, mm -hmm. not actually a hobo. I mean, I have a, a house and a roof over my head, yeah. but uh, yeah, just searching right now. Hopefully mm -hmm. I can find something soon. I took a little bit of a break for like a few months and now I've been starting to like really pick up on the search. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can potentially work for a company or work as an independent contractor, but that's how it usually goes. Is that correct? Uh, so yeah, as a, for a company typically it's full time. I've heard that contract gigs have really increased these days. Mm -hmm. uh, post layoffs, but, um, I could also do contracting if you mean like freelancing. Yeah. Uh, freelancing. I hear that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't tried it yet, 
Um, but maybe sometime if it like it got to that point, I might try it or I might try like kind of doing my own thing, like make my own app. Uh, I've thought of ideas for that, but I haven't really pursued those yet because I'm kind of hoping to have a job first. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I could also just go that route and go really hard on like a, an app or my own business. Yeah, you know, always take the daring ventures and hopefully make it big, just like any other yeah, entrepreneur. Just like Julius. Oh, boy. Well, thank you so much for that. <laughs> I, yeah. Doing your own ventures and being an entrepreneur, it's the dream to be independent yeah. and make your own money and make the choices you want in life compared to yeah. like going to college, getting a degree and getting a safe job, which in my opinion, actually most people should do because statistically yeah, you believe speaking, in the college route. Yeah. Even though I'm not doing it, yeah. <laughs> but I also don't have a college degree, so yeah. <laughs> I feel yeah. bad. So yeah. for people who don't have college degrees but still want to get into the tech field, software engineering, whatever the case may be, hardware or software, uh, what would you think personally would be the first steps to get your foot in, foot in the door for the tech industry? Yeah, so I think people um, keep having this kind of like you know, debate of whether or not you really need a college degree to make it in software. And I mean, obviously biased opinion because it worked for me <laughs> uh, that I don't think that's the case. And people underestimate what you can do without a college degree, especially when it comes to a field like tech. There are some fields that just you can't make it happen the same way. Like if you wanted to be a doctor or like a, a surgeon, Mm -hmm. You know, anything in medical besides nursing, you got to go to college, you got to do medical school uh, and get your credentials and become a doctor. Um, but in a field like uh, software engineering specifically, um, you definitely don't need college. College can help you with certain things. So if you're debating on it and you think that you definitely want to get into tech and you uh, are okay with something like doing community college and then going into a four year, you know, save some money because especially it costs so much, then sure, you can do it. It will teach you a lot of really good low level skills and un fundamental understanding of software and like even hardware. I think like a lot of colleges make you do that. The downside is a lot of the time when you're learning in college, it's more outdated. You're going to learn like very older languages. You're not going to learn modern technologies like Vue, React, or like you probably, you might do Spring Boot. I'm, I know I'm throwing out technologies now, but typically a lot of people in college just work on very basic like levels. Like a lot of their projects are on the terminal, uh, which is just text. And they don't even really do like a lot of larger projects. And I heard that the largest they ever do is like a, a mini game. You know, I don't know. I, I forgot what it was, <laughs> but it was super small. <laughs> Whereas like when you're actually in the field, it's very different, but you might have a fundamental understanding. This is why it's super possible to go into tech without actually having to have a degree. You can learn the practical knowledge, make projects, at, and like sell yourself on that end of knowing practical knowledge and being able to quickly assimilate into what they need for their tech stack, like their kind of um, technologies that they use. When I say tech stack, that's what it means. Um, so yeah, and that's how I did it. I went to a boot camp. I went to App Academy in San Francisco. And after I finished the program, um, I had a coach and they helped me with interview tips and like you know, how to best sell myself and my projects that I made. And it worked out. That's exactly what happened. I knew what would happen in the interview process, how to best like, you know, go about it or to the best of my ability. Because uh, honestly, the interview process is relatively straightforward. Like, you know what's going to happen, but it's up to you if you're going to prepare that much. And if you are prepared to speak uh, um, in like, the language that they speak when they're interviewing you, because that's also important. They want you, you want them to feel like you can definitely fit in. Uh, and as much as it, it, it's like a cringe thing to say culture fit, that's what a lot of people kind of look for. And culture fits, not just like something super basic or like surface level. When I say culture fit, I mean, they need to feel like you fit in with them. And like, if they, if you were in their team, they could talk to you. Right. So it's not always something super stiff and like, you know, just fitting in with the job description culture fit. It's more like, can you casually speak about like scrum and like 
the process of like Q&A and not feel super awkward about it. So stuff like that, you know, and then like you can definitely still get into tech, just like working on that, working on your projects. You don't even really need a boot camp. You just need to do the process that a boot camp helps you commit to. But a lot of people have trouble kind of committing to self-learning and self-taught, uh, although it's free. <laughs> so a lot of people can start there. Um, but a boot camp can kind of help lead you. Uh, but it will be up to you in the end. You can't just expect because you went to a boot camp, it's like, now I have a job. It's just going to help you know exactly what you need to do. And then you have to put in the work to then sell yourself and like show quality in your work. And then you can get a job. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, what what's uh, the company culture's favorite word just to make everything work within a structure? Synergy. Oh, my God. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. <laughs> unironically, it does depend on, you know, the individual's uh, skill base well, within the industry that they're in. Like there's no sugarcoating it. You know, you got to put in the work and apply the pragmatic uh, experiences and knowledge and training just to get the job and get the job done, whether it be from tech, sales, well, except the medical, the medical field, as you said, it's like kind of a rare exception. It's like you actually do need a lot of everything, not including just the schooling, but the pragmatic side of it, which is basically you have to go into uh, housing and then doing your like uh, your three to five years, if I recall, because my family oh, yeah, in the, the residency. Yeah, residency. Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. Residency, residency, housing. And then you got to do a bunch of other crap. So that's why, that, you know, it's a rare exception for the medical field because you're dealing with human lives. Like yeah. there's, there's a high threshold for it because, you know, you're dealing with people, you know, yeah. like, yeah. And death. Exactly. Yeah. With other fields, you're just dealing with, you know, things, but you're dealing with people, but you're, you're dealing mostly with the products. Yeah. It's like products that, you know, it's not going to kill somebody usually. <laughs> uh, you, you'd hope not. You'd hope not. But I guess some people might make that happen. And I really hope that doesn't happen too often, but I mean, when we're speaking very, like, generally, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. So for people that still want to get into this field, and eventually they start doing their credentials, whether it be a boot camp, whether it be highly informal training for five to 10 years of just doing the thing, and then being in a bunch of projects and building up their resume here and there, how would you tackle the interview process of going through companies and hopefully landing your big first tech job or your first startup or your first very small uh i, I, I don't know what they call it what's the word for it when like you're just starting a small company it's like another word for a startup i forgot what that's called um i mostly just think of startup and then there's mid size and then okay. large yeah but yeah okay. maybe there's another word yeah yeah um well so i'd say that yeah, again, the interview process is like relatively straightforward. A lot of companies copy what other companies do. Mm -hmm. So what you can generally expect is that you're going to have either uh, a technical assessment or a phone screen uh, and or. I mean, really, it's like you can have the technical assessment first and then the phone screen, or you're going to have the phone screen and then a technical assessment. And a technical ex assessment can vary a little bit. It's either like a take-home you know, small project that you create and then like somebody will review, usually like an engineering manager or a senior engineer. Uh, and then they would interview and talk to you with like about that project. Or they're just going like, and what it usually is, is just, just this like algorithmic questions, like three of them, three to five algorithm questions, maybe like a uh, like something else thrown in as well, um, like database question query. Uh, but typically just like an algorithm or five <laughs> and you're at times like an hour or an hour and a half, two hours to finish those and complete them, uh, with like an optimal, uh, solution and nobody's monitoring you for those. Uh, so you just need to prepare, do algorithms as much as you can to, uh, understand like structurally how they work and like a lot of different approaches. Um, and I guess because nobody's monitoring you. You technically could also use the internet to your benefit, but I'd say that's like tough because um, if you're trying to use the internet, you're kind of not trying to involve yourself in the algorithm itself. And that might actually make it more difficult to solve it. Uh, some people also have like other people next to them, like other engineers, and they like 
work on it together. So these ones are usually like easier to get through if you start doing stuff like that. But I'd really like emphasize trying to be able to do it on your own and having the knowledge yourself because moving forward, what's going to happen if you didn't already do the phone screen, you would do a phone screen with a uh, HR and then you may have a technical screening. Uh, and this will have like an engineer with you, maybe regular, maybe senior, maybe engineering manager. And they're going to watch and talk to you about the al algorithm that they provide. And you'll have about 45 minutes to talk about your background, what you've done, your experience. And if we're talking like non uh, college degree and stuff, and you've done projects, you're probably going to be talking about your projects, what you've done, the technologies you used, and like uh, things you might have learned, uh, how to best optimize it, especially if they looked at your uh, app or your project and they found some things that they thought might be better. You guys might start like bouncing back about that. Um, so just be ready to talk about your projects and like in detail and speak about the technologies you used and like other things you might have added, wanted to add, uh, any problems you may have faced, just have those basic things ready. After that, they'll provide the algorithm. They'll probably read it out to you or they'll have you read it out. And then you're going to just, they're just going to stay quiet. I mean, it depends on the interviewer, but generally they're going to be quiet and they're giving, they like putting it on your side. You have to lead this conversation and start talking through the solution. Uh, and they don't want you to just like be quiet, look down and start like typing in the solution and then you're done. Even if it's correct, most interviewers would not push you forward. It's important to show your communication and to actually be able to first just solve the problem. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then look back after a discussion about like what you did and optimize it, make it better. And then I don't know if I'm going too much into detail with these things, but <laughs> you know, like basically uh, you'll just do that algorithm and uh, if you're able to just like speak and communicate very well and fluently, um, typically uh, like the person interviewing you will push you forward. From there, after that uh, interview, you'll probably, if it's like a larger company or even a mid-sized company, you'll have a panel after that. And this can range from like two to maybe even five interviews in a row in one day. Maybe some companies let you spread it out like over two days, but uh, generally it's like back-to-back -back interviews and they're either going to be the same algorithm style that I just like laid out for you, or it's going to be behavioral. And they're talking to you about like culture fit and other cringe stuff like that, that you just have to be ready to answer questions about like scenarios. What would you do in this situation? What kind of like team player you are, stuff like that. What's your best environment? Um, and always have questions ready. I mean, this is something that's emphasized a lot. If you looked up anything on interviews at the end of the interview, always have questions ready and try to make them relatively unique. They don't have to be like, something they've never heard before, but, you know, just come up with something and like try to come up with something different for each interviewer is what I'd say. Don't ask them the same question. And that's what I have. Um, so yeah, it can like, you know, be a short interview. Some companies like startups could sometimes get this process done in a week when you start on Monday and then you're hired on Friday, but larger companies, it's going to be a little bit longer. Like what I just like, described. Yeah. For sure. Um, that was a lot. Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> you that's wanted me not to it. say that much. What What I'm actually surprised about is you think that the interview was all 100% technical, like show your performance, show that you've done the work and show that you know what you're doing and what you're talking about. But also what most interviewers probably didn't know about was the communication aspect of it to show a certain competency of another skill towards the company whether it be, you know, as you said, unfortunately, cultural fits, synergy, uh, see if you can communicate correctly what you're working with, you know, what optimal solutions. I'm not familiar with the tech field, whether you're doing, uh, well, I, I forgot what you said. It was like this thing or this other thing. So it was like A or B, like they have to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, as you said, are you doing the right optimal path or how is your thinking different where it can lead to a solution that is yeah. viable uh, during that interview or what you're writing within said if it if it's code or if you're writing something I, I don't know I'm not familiar with uh, these terms yeah no but, worries I mean you pretty uh, much got it it's like you know some companies you don't even have to get the perfect answer and you know if you if it's like Google or Amazon or something you probably do have to have the perfect answer but if it's like a startup or even mid-sized companies a lot of them they really just trying to see how you communicate because uh, contrary to what might be popular belief 
you actually talk a lot. <laughs> you <laughs> jump yeah. into a lot of meetings. You're talking about the project, what you've done. I mean, if you guys know agile workflows, if you're interested in tech, that's something super common where it's like you have a meeting every single day and you have to update everybody in your team how what you're working on, whatever project or thing you're doing, how it's doing. If you hit any problems, they call it blockers and like, you know, estimates on like when you can maybe complete it. It depends on your team, but you're going to be talking every single day. You might even jump into meetings with designers very often if you have a problem or if they want to run something by you. Um, like it's definitely a lot of talking. It's not just just sitting at your desk and you code for eight hours. I mean, I, there might be days where there it is like that. But typically, it's like a very social, communicative, like position. So that's something huge in the interview. And a lot, there are many smaller companies that just want you to be able to communicate well. Maybe just come up with a solution and being very open to discussing a better one. Maybe you'll even come up with like the better one, but you won't have to even write it out. And they're still okay with that because you have so much potential with communicating. And every like a lot of people know that in forty-five minutes doesn't show like you don't have to solve something always in 45 minutes um but interviews in like large companies they want that because i guess they can be more picky more people are applying mm -hmm. um, yes. but most people know that's like you know when you actually work on a project you're given unlimited i mean relative unlimited time you have at least a whole day or like multiple days weeks to like look it up discuss with other people and like solve whatever problem you're solving so yeah an interview is like just focus on communicating, being like nice and listening to your interviewer as well. They often give you hints and they want you to pick up on that. And that's really important. Not just mm. being good at solving something. Mm. I, I want to pinpoint on that, actually, because a lot of people definitely do give you hints on what they want when you're talking and communicating to them, especially in interviews. And if you can't catch up on that, then most likely you're not going to get the job or you have a lower chance to even get that job at all. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, so you want to like know the yeah, kind like, of hints they give? Yeah. Yeah. What example uh, w would that be? So um, I don't know, give a scenario and then hopefully you can help pinpoint out those hints that the interviewer is giving to the interviewee. Yeah. Uh, so it depends on your interviewer. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be super direct and others will frame it in a question okay so how would you pick that up uh, yeah so it's like maybe you're writing through your uh algorithm and either in the middle of it or when you're done um your interviewer might ask you a question they might be like hey uh can you just like walk through it and tell me how this works when they say something like that that typically means you probably have a bug or an error somewhere and you need to pick up that you made like a typo or like you made a small mistake somewhere you're like, oh, you know, this happened. And then uh, usually an interviewer will be like, yeah, or like they'll kind of give you an acknowledgement uh, that you got that right. Uh, other times, maybe they're just like, they could be more specific and they can say like, hey, if we look at this part of your solution, um, can you tell me how that works? They're usually trying to point you on like how it might like have an issue or if they uh, feel like that there's something better you can do, they'll ask you, can we make this better, right? That one's a more obvious one. Uh, if they ask that, that means there is a better version and you can say like, oh, okay, uh, let's like, you know, talk about what might be able, like might, me, might be a way to like improve this. Um, and then you go back and forth, you might bring up some ideas and they can like work with you. It's really up to your interviewer from there. But yeah, it's like usually they'll form it in like questions. And if they ask you the question, try not to think it's like, oh, they just don't know. And I'm just going to explain it to them and then they'll get it. Um, it's usually because they've noticed something that you might not have noticed and you should try looking a little bit further in. Um, sometimes it's hard to do that if you're speaking out loud and thinking. Uh, a good way to practice with that is if you work on algorithms on your own, try to speak out loud while you're thinking then. Because when nobody's there, you might have some mistakes, but that's okay. And you'll get used to it and you'll definitely get better at talking through your algorithm out loud, which might feel a little embarrassing. I don't know. It depends on your environment. Um, but when you're in the interview, you definitely have to speak out loud. You can't be silent. So you might as well work on it on your own uh, in private. And that way, when you're talking and looking through it, you might have a better chance of finding where that problem is. Um, and something else is a lot of companies do not 
have you run the code. You mm -hmm. might know what I mean when I say that. It's like you type out the solution and then sometimes there's like a way to like press run and check if it works. Most companies in the interview, they don't let you do that. So your interviewer honestly might not notice the issue either, even if there was a bug. I think it comes down to being very clear on your intent. So when you're typing out the algorithm and you're typing and speaking, you need to be like, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it and this is how it would work. And if you do that throughout the whole process, usually your interviewer just needs to be able to follow what you're saying and saying like, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that works. And that's what's most important. It doesn't matter if they're small typos unless they decide to be like, hey, can you run me through this with like an example, um, which usually you want to do anyway. And then, you know, you'll want to look for it. But yeah, that's kind of my advice and like uh, how you might want to pick up on their hints. Yeah, for sure. That's honestly fantastic because as you said, there's not more than one way uh, the people are going to interview. They're going to be very artistic on how they interview the individual but usually that's how close and generic it will be is if they can catch on the interviewee's errors because if they can't explain why they're doing it or if they don't notice that there's a mistake or you can't tell that there's another optimal solution as you said then it kind of explains and helps notice how the person is thinking in their head, how they're trying to find the solution, how they're trying to um, find the right lines, code, their error, whatever the case may be. Which is exactly what they care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all they care about, actually. So you you really hit the nail on the coffin there. No. Well, thank you. So we're going to go talk about this very unironic go-to substacks. Am I saying that right? Stack flow? Substacks? Yeah, substacks. The one where you just copy and paste the, the code or something, right? Oh, oh stack, stack Overflow? Stack Stack Overflow, or Stack Flow, I guess they call it for short. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Sure. If, yeah, so so people, you know, just always use Stack Flow. When I was in Miami, one of the guys, he was a coder back in the day. He was a really famous dude on YouTube, but I'm not going to say his name. He he used to be a coder, and then he's like, Clement, all you do, yeah, all, wait, what was that? <laughs> Clement? No, it's good. Yeah, no. Nah. So basically what he did and told me, because uh, we were getting like sushi that one night, he's all like, yeah, man, I used to be a coder. And all I did all night was just go on Stackflow and just copy paste. I'm like, really? That's it? It's like, yeah, but it took me like, I don't know, two to five years to get the job. I'm like, okay. <laughs> There's a bunch of like jokes about that online of just like, it shows, it's like the interview process. It shows a bunch of monsters just like fighting in high depth, like <laughs> visuals. And then it's like right below, it's like the actual job. It shows like stuffed animals. <laughs> it's definitely the interview process is way more intense than mm -hmm. the actual job you get like it's a lot more lax and people are there to help you and they're training you even if you have experience anytime you join a new job it's different so they're going to train you a lot of people are afraid of like after they start maybe they didn't like get a lot of experience or they don't feel confident yet and then they're like now i need to prove myself because i have three years of experience mm -hmm. no you're going to get trained and they're going to help you through it yeah but yeah, I mean, it's true that it's not as hard on the job. And yeah, a lot of people use Stack Overflow and I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> but a lot of the time too, you're you're not just using it. And uh, oftentimes you also want to know like how it works. Um, but Stack Overflow is a really good resource um, for like giving you something that, you know, you could type out how to do like a certain complicated math algorithm yourself. Or you could just go on Stack Overflow, type in how to best do this math calculation, and then you could just copy paste that math calculation in. But then you know what you're doing in like the grand scheme of things, like what role it plays. And there's a difference there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you go. Stack Overflow is really good. It has smart people. They give you like solutions and you're just like, thank God there's this. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. people in like the 80s and 90s programming, whew, that yeah. was a different world <laughs> for yeah. solving bugs. But yeah, yeah. I'm, no I'm noticing this weird trend in the tech industry. It's like, oh, I'm like a code purist versus like, oh, I just use other tools like Stack Overflow or Ask a Friend or just use another program that that's been created out of nowhere. It's like, oh. Yeah. Um, I personally don't care about the whole like, you know, trying to be pure coding and like you don't want to use resources like, OK, sure, whatever. But as long as you don't like, I don't know 
tell other people that they're not real or they're like not real programmers just because they're not doing the same thing. Yeah. Well, that's what, to... that's what I've been hearing though. That's what I've been hearing. It's like, oh, you're not a real programmer. If all you use is the Stack Overflow, it's like, well, I mean, yeah, it's still doing it. It's part. Of, it's like, what if you need it because you know you're trying to optimize your time because you're at the job, or you that's have to write thing. something real quick. I've like built programs and websites that are still up right now live that like i i coded 90 percent of it mm -hmm. and the other 10 percent just stack overflow or some other resource github um like community and like i don't see the problem with that getting help you shouldn't like i don't know uh kind of discourage people from mm -hmm. using like help getting help from other people because the whole point is you're trying to build a product and what's the, like, you might want to feel proud that, yeah, you figured it out on your own and like, you'll have a lot of like deep knowledge in that subject. Good for you. But that doesn't mean you're the real programmer. And then somebody who coded a certain amount and then got help for the other amount. Now they're not a programmer. I mean, as long as they understand what they did. I mean, I understand the whole, like, maybe if AI did get to a point where it made everything, don't call yourself a programmer. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. I'm on the side of like people who call themselves artists because they use AI to like draw the art. I'm like, I don't think you're really an artist just because you typed in a prompt what you wanted and then you got the result mm -hmm. by something else building it for you. Then it's like if you had a program manager or product designer, uh, not product designer, like a project manager who just like asked for like something and then they had the whole team make it and then that program manager is going to say like oh yeah i i'm a software engineer because i told these people what i wanted they built it and I, it's i have it now so i'm a software engineer like it makes no sense <laughs> yeah of course, so you of course. Can, as long as you're doing some of the work yourself or when you're getting help you understand what it is and how you're using it and why it's being used I think you're totally fine. You don't have to think that you're not a real programmer or whatever. Just like have the knowledge yourself. That's that's where I have, like where I stand. For sure, man, for sure. All right. Thank you, Shafan, for being on the Jolius podcast. We talked about a lot of things within the tech industry, whether it be from the interview process or how to talk to the people in said interview or just Certain things we don't understand about stocks or the tech industry, but it does its thing anyway, like its own machine. I, I believe investing, by the way. Definitely yeah. invest, but oh, yeah, yeah, of course. there's Always. ways to do it that's aside from that. <laughs> but yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we head out? I mean, anybody watching that's like interested in getting to tech, just just got to do it and like you just got to put in the work i mean i'm not making it i don't want to make it sound like it would take so much i may maybe the way i was describing it makes it sound complicated but you could definitely do it it feels overwhelming in the beginning but if you jump in and you just get started and you try to commit to a schedule of working on it and getting a little better every single day you'll definitely get there where, where can they find you Shafan? they can find me on instagram at uh the shafam so it's t-h-e-s-h-a-p-h a M. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, on Instagram, you just DM me. I'm happy to answer your questions. Or you can get me on LinkedIn. Uh mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you have show notes, but it's just my name, Shafan Pangburn. It'll say like X Google or something. Uh, and you can add me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to help out uh any way I can. Yeah. And quick tip for you guys that are within the tech industry or joining any industry that's pretty, pretty prominent, pretty big up there. Uh get on LinkedIn, you know, because people are looking at social media yeah. and LinkedIn is one of the big ones, especially if you're trying to get into like a very serious field like tech or law. Yeah. Mostly it's just, you know, word of mouth, but also, you know, looking at the big presence of social media. I, I heard actually that statistically the majority of HR is on LinkedIn and actively searches for candidates on LinkedIn. So it's definitely a good resource. It's got its, you know, you know, not so perfect parts. Like even though it's a professional social media site, there's also memes, there's, you know, mm -hmm. random hot takes and stuff, and it'll make it look kind of not as good, but it definitely also is a very good resource for connecting with actual professionals and other HR representatives from many companies, and then having a huge network that you can then reach out to for referrals or 
applying for jobs very quickly. You know, if you just want to just like spread out a lot of applications, uh, which in tech, it might be something you want to consider because it's like very tough to get a job. You don't just apply to a few and then many of them will get back to you. You often have to like machine gun a lot. You'll come up with a lot of cover letters and resumes. Uh, so definitely, I also recommend LinkedIn is a really good resource. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Shafan, for that quick tip. All right, guys, this is the Jolie's podcast. Me and my good friend Shafan are shutting off. So I'll see y'all later. Peace.